Good morning, everybody. Um, absolute pleasure to be here, obviously, today. Right, I'm here to talk a bit about the future of drug repurposing uh, today, but uh, before we get onto that, that main topic of conversation, I just want to take a minute to focus on the issue of rare diseases as a whole. I think it kind of sets the scene for the, the whole conference and why we're here. Um, they're a huge issue. I think we all agree with that. We want to, it's an area we want to see a lot more research done in, a lot more attention given to, to make sure the patients get the support and care that they deserve. So in the EU, a rare disease is defined as a condition that affects less than one in 2,000 of the general population. That doesn't sound particularly prevalent, but when you spread that across the UK, that's about 3.5 million people. Across the world, 350 million people affected by a rare condition. That is a sizable proportion of the global population. Um, the symptoms they live with are really varied, wide and disparate. But despite that, there's a huge shared commonality between their experience. That's primarily driven by things like diagnostic odyssey, and the fact that it takes such a long period to secure uh, an accurate diagnosis, most patients taking about a four-year period on average, going through up to three misdiagnoses, seeing multiple clinicians. A really hard initial experience for anyone with a rare condition. Alongside that, patients can struggle with holding down uh, full-time work, uh, issues in securing the education they, they deserve. Uh, uh, but fundamentally, um, this statistic here, the fact that of the roughly 7,000 rare genetic conditions out there, only about 400 have licensed treatments. You get your diagnosis, and there's often very, little, very few places for you to turn. There's no, there's no treatment, and, and very few people doing research, little hope of treatment. And, and that is an isolating, uh, a devastating thing, a hard thing to cope with, that lack of hope. What we do see, though, and the most fantastic thing about the rare disease community uh, is the patient empowerment. The, the patients themselves take ownership of their condition. They drive forwards to try and, and make change themselves, to try and get to a point where they can recognise their own power and use their determination to deliver change for, for themselves. Uh, and that's really what Find a Cure are all about. And today is about trying to come together to recognise the different role that patient groups have been able to play in driving forward repurposing and to look at repurposing as a fantastic route to hopefully uh, bring more treatments to patients in the future. So for that reason, uh, my, 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 my talk title is The Future of Drug Repurposing for Rare Diseases. Uh, but it's always good to be a little bit controversial at the start of this conference. So I'm going I'm to modify that. I'm going to be bold. I'm going to say the future is drug repurposing for rare diseases and hopefully I can convince you that this isn't a crazy statement. Uh, I'm not a complete crazy person. I'll put a little asterisk there because I recognise many other things are also the future of rare diseases. Uh, patient engagement definitely is something we want to see. It's already here and it's going to grow. We're going to see more involvement of patients in research. Not only that, the revolution uh, of genomics, we're seeing this really changing the way diagnostics is approached and driving more patients through to the point where they can actually understand the, the genetic basis for their, their disease. And that's leading us to a point where we have uh, hopefully more personalised medicine, treatments that are tailored to individual patients. Uh, and, and then finally, gene editing on the horizon, the, the, the ability to actually go in and modify the genome in the future could get us to a point where we can really um, have fast lifetime curative treatments for some of these conditions. Um, so given all that, I hear you ask repurposing, why bother? Why are we here today? I like my medicines new and innovative. Well, I'm going to tell you that's wrong. Um, we need to bother because new and innovative tend to take a long time and cost a lot of money for a start, and we need to do something more quickly now to help those patients in help. And we need to look at the general strategic overview. This is the situation in the pharma industry recently. It's a bit of an old graph I've shown many times, but in, in the red bars here we see the number of new drugs that have been approved on an annual basis, uh, running here from 96 across to 2013. There's a general downward trend there, we can all agree, dropping from about over 50 here to around 25 in 2013. We're seeing less new drugs reach market. Overlaid on that, we have this green line, a trend going up. This is the average, uh, this is the overall R&D spend in US billions of dollars to produce those same drugs. We are producing fewer drugs for more money, is what this graph tells us. At the bottom here, we see the cost on average for a new drug in US billion dollars. In 96, we're looking at 0.3 billion to get a new drug to market. Over here, 2013, 1.8 billion dollars to get a drug to market. The system is still working, it's still delivering new drugs, but it's getting somewhat less efficient. We need some new methods, new approaches to drive treatments through to patients. If we layer on that the, the situation with rare diseases, in a way, during this time period, they've been a, a new market, if you like, a new opportunity for the pharma industry. They've seen patients that are unserved and begun to, to deliver more often drugs, which is fantastic. We want to see that. However, there is undeniably a situation with small patient populations, and that means the pharma need to recoup their investment, and we are seeing exceptionally high prices for those orphan drugs that are reaching market. 
this graph shows and the, and the price uh, per year from 2012 to 2016 uh, for non-orphan versus orphan drugs. Non-orphans in the dark, orphans in the bl light blue. That kind of tells you what you need to know simply. If we look at 2016, we can see the average price per patient per year of about £27,000 to deliver a non-orphan drug. Uh, an orphan drug, £114,500 per patient per year to, to provide that orphan drug to patients. So clearly, that situation is not going to be sustainable across 7,000 different rare conditions. Uh, people won't be able to pay for the drugs. So drug repurposing is hopefully a strategy we can begin to exploit to, to change the situation. And what is it? Very simply, at its most basic level, drug repurposing is recycling. Um, it, it's the process of taking a drug that's approved for one patient population, running clinical trials to test the efficacy of those treatments in a completely different patient population. Um, essentially, we're trying to make ourselves more efficient in using the drugs that are available. Uh, this is hugely advantageous, as I say, because it makes things potentially quicker and cheaper, and that can only be good for the complexities of working in the residency space. So we eliminate the costly, time-consuming process of de novo drug discovery. Um, because we know something about the safety and the side effects of these drugs, we have an advantage. If we're working on, gene uh, on generic drugs, we have a huge wealth of human history. You know, we, we've seen these drugs used time and time again in many different patient populations. All of that information can save time because it can reduce our requirement for early stage clinical trials. Again, speeding the development process, lowering the costs. We also know about the pathways of action of these drugs. We know where they work in the body. And if we know that, potentially it can help us identify drugs that could work effectively for our favourite rare condition. We can limit the number of drugs we're screening from thousands in a mass screening approach to maybe in the tens. Again, speeding the process, lowering the cost. Strategically, this is, a, this is a way that can really help move things along to get treatments more quickly to patients. Generic drug repurposing should be really popular for those reasons because we have that wealth of data to exploit. But unfortunately, you know, there, there is a business case that has to be made and it's hard to secure intellectual property on, on products that have already been through out of patents. And for this reason, generally what we're seeing is it's hard for industry, for the pharmaceutical industry, to look at repurposing generics. That isn't really happening too much. What we were interested in at Find a Cure is, is this happening in other areas? Are we seeing other groups like academics or clinicians beginning to play with drug repurposing to try and drive things for rare diseases? So we've been working last year uh, on, a, on a, re a literature review of drug repurposing in rare diseases itself with Costello Medical. And this was a very simple uh, approach, just trying to dig into the published abstracts that are out there online and try and find out how often the word repurposing is co-occurring with rare disease terms, trying to see what's going on out there. If I remember correctly, the search only went back to about 2007, so still a relatively short period of time. We found 167 different cases so far which are looking at repurposing and rare diseases out there in the literature. Definitely something that's happening and growing. If you dig into those numbers, there's some interesting patterns. We're seeing about 47 of those looking at paediatric studies. These are people trying to find ways to treat kids. 75% of rare diseases affect children, so again, it's kind of what you'd expect. These are some of the interesting stats, though. About 70 of these studies are reporting off-label use in rare conditions. We're suggesting clinicians uh, in practice are trying to find, find drugs that they, they think they can use and reporting on its impact in an off-label way. It's not been approved or tested for those patients. What's interesting especially is that generally this isn't, is often not reported. So if 70 cases are reported in the literature, how many of those cases are, are going on unreported? 11 are based on case reports, but if we look over here, we can see only three are reported through full clinical trials and four through retrospective analyses. So we seem to have a, a, a lack of some of these more rigorous, scientifically um, assessed approaches to assess the impact of rare conditions. It seems that the, the ideas are there, but finding funding to actually drive it through to get the, the rigorous assessment of how this works isn't quite happening yet. Um, last year, we also ran a rare repurposing open call with our collaborators Helex and Cures Within Reach. And the idea behind this was to try and, again, go out there and survey the, the academic, the patient group audience to find out you know, what is going on out there with repurposing. What are the ideas you've got that you're trying to move through to get to clinic? Uh, that ran for three months, finishing up, I think, in around uh, May or June. Uh, and this is a summary of the results that we, we had. Um, across that time, 38 different proposals came in of people who had a repurposing project they wanted to get some assistance with. Um, and these are really diverse. You know, It does include some of the big, common, rare conditions you'd expect to see, cystic fibrosis, uh, sickle cell, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But not only that, we're seeing repurposing happening in lots of ultra-rare conditions, so things like epidermolosis bullosa, adult polyglucosin body disease, and P10 syndrome. Uh, of the 38 proposals, 11 of them were in rare conditions that are reporting a prevalence no higher than 1 in 50,000. These are 
ultra-rare diseases that people are out there researching, which is a fantastic, encouraging statistic. Not only that, we're seeing 17 of the proposals directly involve patient groups. They're involved in those collaborations themselves. Patient groups are getting more and more involved and active in the research space, something we want to see more of. Uh, and down here of interest is, I mean, this is slightly biased because we were primarily asking for clinical studies, but there's a clear skew here to people who are getting their preclinical work done, but they're, they're struggling to get funding to move into that clinical research stage, the stage where things become more expensive to deliver research. We think the work is out there, but moving it through to clinic is where we're struggling. So that gives you an idea of the work we've been trying to do, trying to assess the landscape for repurposing in the last year. Um, and we think this kind of backs up our point that, that repurposing really is an ideal model for academic or patient group driven collaborations to drive treatments through to patients. And, and hopefully today, our, our program will help to reinforce that point. Um, we've got, a no I think all of our main speakers involve patient collaborations within the work they're doing, whether they're in big pharma, whether we've got biotechs, or whether we're looking at patient group driven work themselves. Uh, we're going to be hearing from, from Caroline next, uh, whose who's non-profit foundation is driving forward repositioning of shelf compounds within pharma to get them out to patients. Obviously, we have Novartis speaking about their work, re repositioning a, a drug that they had available on their shelves that, that they can actually move into a, a rare condition. For examples of an acad academic collaboration, I'll be talking about more shortly, um, and Mike Briggs will be, will be giving us details on where they're trying to have a, a large international academic collaboration to repurpose a generic drug for a skeletal rare condition. And then things like the work of the Wolfram Syndrome guys and, and Tracy Lynch, who's uh, Wolfram Syndrome UK patient group, going to be heavily involved in, in a generic drug repurposing trial run out of Birmingham Children's Hospital. There's a lot of fantastic work being done, and, and today is about showcasing that and showing you what is happening. What I'm going to focus on now for the last few minutes of my talk is this project that, that me and Mike will be talking about today, um, MCDS therapy. So I'm really pleased to say that MCDS therapy is, is a big academic collaboration that has been uh, funded by the European Union. So we've just secured a, a Horizon 2020 research grant, uh, which is going to help drive this project forward. Um, MCDS itself stands for Metaphysial Chondrodysplasia Type SMID, which is a delightful rare disease mouthful. Um, Essentially, it's a rare bone condition. It causes problems with collagen and bone growth. So it leads to patients having short stature, uh, but more pertinently, disproportionate limb size, so disproportionately short limbs, and often bowing of the legs. And what you can see here in this x-ray, the, the, the curvature in the long bones, but also the flaring at the end of the long bones. And this can lead to problems with, with joint pain, particularly in later life, which can be quite severe, and also issues with gait, which can all lead to a, a, a quite a lower quality of life. It's something that, that you think would be hard to treat, but the team uh, of academic researchers around the world have been really digging into the underlying mechanisms of this condition for the last few years. Um, they've identified, as I say, uh, that the condition is caused by a mutation in a, a specific type of collagen, one of the connective proteins in the body, called collagen 10. Um, what happens is there's a misfolding of this protein, which means it doesn't actually get kicked out of the cells. Instead, it, where it should then form the bony matrix, it gets retained in the cells. And that's the underlying problem for the condition. So they've done a huge amount of work elucidating this mechanism, but not only that, they've gone and identified a drug, a generic drug, carbamazepine, uh, which has real potential to, to help alleviate this fundamental mechanistic problem. From there, they've then developed, um, in mice models, a proof of concept to show that in MCDS mice, you can restore usual bone growth in the mice, not only to size, but remove some of these deformities as well, which is a fantastic piece of work. Uh, using this, We've then been able to secure, uh, well, I say we, really, we've had a very minor role in it, but Mike and the team have been able to secure uh, EU funding to, to actually run uh, an academic-driven clinical trial in patients over the next five years. So that's what we're doing in this project. Um, it's, a, it's a big collaboration. You can see in the map here, partners spread across Europe, and also a tiny version of Australia here. Australians are also involved. Um, and there's a whole range of different partners, and I'm really pleased to say that Find a Cure are going to be involved in a small way in this project for the next five years. Um, our role is primarily going to be about disseminating information. Um, we want to get out there and tell the public, tell the rare disease world about the work that's been done and try and highlight the excellent research. We also want to try and help build the MCDS patient community to give them uh, the chance to put their voice into the heart of this project, which I think is crucial to all the partners uh, that we were talking to last week. Um, so our major aim then as, as a charity is to help build an open collaborative project to put the patient need right at the heart of the research and to hopefully make this project a gold standard example of an academic-driven collaboration to deliver repurposing to the patients that need it. Um, here's a, just a summary of our overall aims uh, for the project. Um, we're aiming to deliver a low-cost repurposed therapy. 
so unheard of almost, a low-cost drug uh, for a rare skeletal condition, um, which will hopefully alleviate the pain and some of the malformations in the bones for these patients. Um, we're going to work closely with all our academic collaborators around the world to make sure we have the most excellent research possible um, and really drive this drug to market outside of the usual developmental pathway. Um, we're trying to pioneer, pioneer an academic drug repurposing pathway to hopefully inspire others to look at this route in the future, particularly for rare diseases. Uh, and, and hopefully that's going to become a bit of a new paradigm in orphan drug development, which can work alongside the existing pharma routes uh, to drive treatments to patients. So if you'd like to hear more about this, you're going to have a lovely talk with lots of detail from Mike later on in the programme. Uh, but we're already up and live on Twitter, uh, so you can follow us there at MCDS Therapy to hear about the work that's going on in the next five years. And there'll be a new website and a Facebook site coming very soon. So if you're interested in learning more, please do contact uh, myself, Libby, or any of the Find a Cure team, and we'll be happy to hook you up with the mailing list when we get that going and, and keep you up to date with what's happening with this project, which, which I hope you'll agree is quite an exciting thing. So I'm going to wrap up now. Um, on time, even though we started late, so that means I'm very, very good. Um, basically, hopefully this talk has given you an idea that, that, that repurposing is a major part of the future for rare diseases. Um, Traditional drug discovery routes, they can't deliver for all rare diseases on their own. We definitely need some new pipelines, new pathways to work alongside the, the, the traditional pharma methods that are out there. We, we love new, exciting, innovative treatments, but what we want to see is things coming through for those patient groups who are just left without hope. And we think repurposing can begin to play a role in that. It offers a quicker, cheaper, and a collaborative route to development of effective treatments. And that can only be a good thing, especially if patient groups are part of that collaboration. Um, these type of collaborations are beginning to prove successful, which we will see today, as I've said. And, and there are more different approaches and different models to drive these treatments through being developed right now. Um, the MCDS Therapy Project aims to deliver a new, low-cost treatment from bench to bedside um, in an ultra-rare skeletal condition, an area that you might intuitively think is hard to deliver change in. And uh, as a charity, um, Find a Cure are going to continue to promote drug repurposing as widely and as loudly as we can. Uh, and, and hopefully continue to gain traction with the NHS um, for our social impact bond model that I've been talking about a lot in the last few years, but thought I'd uh, switch attention today. But I'm very happy to, to talk about that generally uh, to the audience one-on-one -on -one or in questions now. Um, so with that, I'll give you my traditional Find a Cure thank you slide. Thank you for your attention. Please enjoy the day. Uh, meet a lot of people, ask a lot of questions, and um, yeah, enjoy yourselves. Thank you very much. <laughs>